notice I'm not concerned with pressure here because this applies to any refrigerant. It's the temperatures we really have to be concerned about. So this temperature goes up and if you look When I have overcharge, it means there's liquid more or less to that point, right? Yeah. So what I've done, the fan is going, so I'm cooling this liquid down half, like 50% of the liquid is down to 95 degrees already, right? Mm-hmm. I only have half of the condenser coil to cool the remaining refrigerant. So temperature here goes up, Temperature in this little liquid line is 95 degrees, right? What do you think is my subcooling at that point? The subcooling at that point, I can't see the other number. No, if my liquid line now is at 95 degrees. And the temperature? Well, is that 145? And my condenser saturation is 145. I'd say then you have a high... Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Which, which translates 50. because the temperature is up. 50 degrees, right? 50 degrees. Yeah. Guys, so an overcharge system, you see where my sub is. That makes sense, though, because it's overcharged. Right. It's liquid sitting in your condenser. I'm looking at that. I'm going to take care of it. Uh, we talk, don't leave elevator, right? right? Just need to know. It's, it's, over, yeah, it's overfilled. Right, so, so once you overfill it, there is, you're restricting the amount of area or surface area now to cool that refrigerant vapor. So that, it's causing high head pressure. It's going to cause a high head pressure, high temperatures. Then whatever refrigerant is in the bottom of that coil, that cools right down to ambient. So subcooling increases. Oh, and no. guys, uh, <laughs> overcharge. Now, there is a toss up. I said, you know, when some people say high sub cooling, they mean they may mean the same thing as when this group says low sub cooling. So you have to be careful and have somebody kind of explain exactly what I mean. You know, this is high sub cooling. Because normal soft cooling is about um, 20 degrees, right? right? It's more than doubling. So it's more than doubling that. So that's high soft cooling. Low soft cooling is if I'm, if I had like five degrees. Only five degrees. But that's what overcharge tend to do. With this system. Now, here's the thing. If I have a restriction in that system, right? And my restriction happens to be, you know, right here I put a filter dryer. Yeah. So if my restriction happens to be in here, refrigerant backs up in this here uniformly. All right? So I'm getting high head pressure, but all of this will be at the same temperature. Oh, because there's nothing. All right. Yeah. So all of this should be at the same temperature because what happens? All, all of it will be at liquid temperature, right? So it ain't going to be So I'm gonna get. If this temperature was supposed to be 125, let's see now it goes up to 135. Yeah. What did I have out there? 145 you have. 145. This ain't going to be 95 anymore because it's not going to be. It's going to be like 135 or 140. Mm -hmm. So you see the difference when you have a restriction, your subcooling number is so <coughs> The saturation and temperature. Saturation temperature and subcooling temperature will be pretty close together. Okay, because 125 is subcooling temperature there. 
It's not going to get a chance to go too close to ambient. Right? So those are two little indications that can point you directly to what your problem is. And to confirm, take a, to confirm that this is partially take black, a take a temperature reading side. across the two. <coughs> if you have one degree temperature difference, block it. change it. Because you, <coughs> it is beginning to black up because it's a partial restriction. It's not going to get any better. Don't feel bad if you get no better. It's going to get worse. All right? So if you're on the service call, just explain to your customer, hey, this is what I want. Okay, and I need to open up the system, which is a whole new ball game right now. Because it's like, um, first you were dealing with honeybees, now you're dealing with African bees. So, mm -hmm. Okay, so you got to Yes, you got to recover that. You don't have anything. You know, if you have pumped down with the king valve, you could have pumped the system down. Because if you have a receiver, you can shut off that receiver service valve, transceed it, pump the whole system down and do anything in that system from the point of the receiver service valve right back to the compressor suction. You can take apart that whole section with the refrigerant still in there. Nice. Right, and the, and the valves in the compressor actually hold the gas back. Yes, this, the discharge valve actually holds it, the gas back in a um, thing because in the whole scheme of things, you see discharge valves is like this, suction pressure is like this. As the piston goes down, this opens up to bring in vapor and as it goes up, this opens to discharge. to discharge. But if I'm getting back pressure from here, that closes off completely. Nothing can go there unless I have a leak or busted, in there. Busted. Read, read. Crack read or something. Um, normally, I don't really see completely busted read. I see them cracked. I've never seen one that's totally um, torn apart. They're more, more, more often than not, they're cracked, and they're cracking in such a way that they stay up. Uh, you know? And of course, that's refrigerant, guys. The molecules are very tiny, so it's going to go through any little crack. space it can find. That's why when you do a vacuum test on the compressor, the air will get through it too, right? Yeah, sometimes, um, if, you, if you're going to put there are some guys who put on a compressor, install a new compressor, and you will find when you go to pressure, the pressure test the system. Normally I pressure test, I add refrigerant from the high side to see that how good that uh, discharge valve will hold before I add to the low side. And sometimes you will see refrigerant blowing back through the compressor into the low side. No big deal, guys. When you put the system together, it's gonna work. If it go whoosh one time and just equalize the pressure, yeah, change the compressor, right? Get it, get it replaced. But if it's just trickling through, it is gonna work because it needs it needs to run a little to seat itself. So don't. I know I know many guys took that compressors manual. And that was it. Thinking that's a problem, that's not a problem. So, um, so these are all our system pressure. Um, yeah, and see, there are some things to gentlemen. Now that we are using all these alternative refrigerants, and you have to be careful that all the charging methods we used to use, we kind of sometimes have to throw some of those out to the, out to the window because they, they're not applicable any, anymore because all these blends of refrigerant, they have what we call a temperature glide. And I'm pretty sure somebody somewhere along the line explained to you What's the temperature glide, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Two, two they boil off at different temperatures. Different, 
saturation temperatures, they boil up, they melt. No, that's fractionation. Fractionation. Glide, temperature glide. I don't think I've heard of that term yet. I thought it was the same as fractionation. Fractionation is when the two refrigerants or the three in the uh, makes up the blend separates and boil at their own each component boil at their own temperature. Because each component boil at their own temperature, there is it creates what we call a glide. Okay. So that's the and the glide is now you know if I take R22 and I come to 68.5. Temperature will be equal to how much? Forty degree Fahrenheit, right? Now, if I take R. 407C, which is a re replacement for that, and I have 68.5 PSIG. This would be evaporator suction. Then my temperature will be equal to 45 degree Fahrenheit. My temperature is not responding the same time the pressure is responding. It always lags behind. So when pressure is doing its own thing here, this temperature needs to catch up with it. So that's where the glide comes in. The glide, see, degree. you will reach 68.5 or there's about on your gauges, the and you will figure that the temperature should be at 40, but it ain't, because now you're gonna take your thermometer and you're gonna measure this for superheat. And you're going to get, now instead of 10 degrees superheat where you get here, you get 15 degrees because of that. Right. So you'll be looking at, okay, am I doing something wrong? No, you're not. This, as you get down to a set point temperature and it'll, system it'll stabilizes, then this and this raise to here. And you get right they into start this to catch up. They catch up. To yes, the two come closer and closer together until they work as one out. But it has to run for a while. Yeah. Depends on the size of the system, it can be as long as 24 hours. So is this something, do, do not shred it if you see this with this <coughs> and this with using this refrigerant. You're not doing anything wrong, guys. It's just to be <coughs> And I think that's about everything for that. Out. You got nothing to worry about. You wear your boots and shirt every day. We didn't do this, right? Uh, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Just a quick five presentation on um,
product temperature that the health inspectors will be looking at because most refrigeration systems you work on is associated with some type of restaurant or deli or bodega or something. You know, it's supposed to walk us through something with the capillary tube? Huh? Right. The what? Capillary tube, right? What happened here? You're supposed to walk us through something like that? With extras? No. Well, you said, you said something like that. You remember, Rob, something with the capillary tube? Cutting it or something, something, something? Put it when in you cut it, you got to use a file. No, I know that, but no, it's something that's telling us about. Oh, size of chart, right? Oh, size of chart. Size of chart. Oh, when you buy it, well, they, they, he gave us, so uh, Juno gave, gave us the sizing charts. Yeah. The capillary. Yeah. Subco, yeah. they were subco. You could get that, though. You can get you that can in a get supply house. In each of those boxes, there's a sizing chart. Yeah. And it's going to show you... Um, that I need 72 inches. Let's say number four. Number four, those That's are the numbers of the different cap tubes, right? right? Number four would be 0 0.064 That's in the diameter, right? inches internal diameter. All right? Now, I do not have a number four here, right? I don't have number four, I have number two. Okay. And number two is 0 0.036 inches internal diameter. So I want to know, okay, how much, what length of number two now can I use to substitute and get the same effect as this 72 inches? So here's the math. 72 multiplied by... 0 0.064 is always equal to the length of the new one I want multiplied by the diameter of that new one, 0 0.036. So if I want to get the length to one side, I divide this by 0 0.0, by 0 0.36. Being an equation, I have to do the same thing here. This cancels out. And if you do the math here, you're going to get L, which is going to tell you how many inches of the new one no, I need. Two. Okay. Interesting to know because, you know, much as there are five different sizes of these cap tube, one, two, five, BC one, two, BC five. It's pretty much standard regardless if it's sub or GMB or somebody else make it. But we don't always have the the correct size that we need. Believe, believe you, yeah. that never happens. You always have the wrong size. So that helps you in the field to use that which you have instead of going out just to buy a box of cap two that costs six bucks. You know? So that will help you. Or if you, want, if you have a uh, calculator, you can do your math for that. So product temperatures for the <coughs> What is that? Inspector looks for inspecting the ice machine, door gasket. Do you guys know that the health department requires that you change um, door gasket or recommends that you change door gaskets every three months? Yeah, yeah, we heard that. Yeah. Yes. No, you said six months. The six months? Yeah, I guess. No. These are four months. Between three and six months, anyhow. Change so, them as much as you can get the customer to pay for them? Please yes. Pay. Okay. I know of some customers who have boxes that are 20 year old and they'll have the same gasket that's fallen to pieces. Okay. They don't want to change it. They don't want to change it. Because of the right? Well, yes, because you're going to get freezing up of the unit so plus your lack of it. You're never going to be down, down to the right temperature. So, refrigeration maintenance program, interest in temperature and health facts. So guys, here's the deal. FDA says 41 degrees the maximum temperature you should keep your box at, right? Maximum permissible or acceptable. Our local regulations out here in Suffolk County say it's 40 degrees. Guess which one you're going to go with? 40 degrees. Yes. So whatever code is the stricter code to go with it. This is... This is um, CFR, 
and our local court trumps the CFR. Yeah, just like in the book, the code books, the local code trumps yeah. the federal code. So reaching box temperatures, 38 walk-ins are designed for 35, and there's a reason. All right, most regioners um, don't contain food anyway. They have drinks and whatever. The product in the freezer must be always frozen solid. All right, some products, some products freeze at zero degrees, some at um, above zero, some you have to put them into a negative 10 uh, box. Um, one of the interesting things, like if you guys go to 7-Eleven and get the Slurpee, yes, the, those is, the product comes out at about 27, 28 degrees. Because uh, right. it's, it's moving. It's moving yes, yeah. but here's the thing. That's because there isn't that much sugar in that. The, you get, the more sugar you put, the lower you have to drop that temperature for it to because you're adding more impurities. So you have to compensate for that impurities you put in there. So more sugar, faster grease? No, more sugar is a, a lower the temperature, not necessarily faster. Lower temperature you you require for it to freeze. <coughs> um, by the way, if you go buy chicken, once it's rock hard, hey, I'm happy. <coughs> And these are um, reaching temperatures for freezers. I think your whole, your whole refrigerator is somewhere in the region is zero to five degrees, so it could be a different. Walk-ins, negative 10 degrees. I thought you were doing this with a camera so you don't have to type to anything. I uh, do both. Camera point over there now. Yeah, that's going to be faster. That's going to be faster. I guess I want to get through this by the next 15 minutes. Yeah, these are interesting temperatures. There will be nothing on the arm. Um, actually, I'm not going to promise it. No promises. So, see, certain certain places they want their walk-in box held at zero degrees. Certain places they want their walk-in to be at negative ten. Negative ten is like a um, pretty much industry standard out there, and it does make a difference when you go here. It also make a difference in the size of the unit you're going to be buying. So run this system, this walk-in box. So this is, this is kind of ambiguous. The, the product in the freezer must be frozen. Kind of goes without saying. Eh? Yeah. Oh, remember I told you this health inspector always coming at lunchtime? Yeah. Yes. When the restaurant is as busy as that's when they, because that's when all the boxes are at the highest temperature, all the so refrigerators all the are open, yeah. the sinks are backed up. They just want to make money. Just like how tow trucks sit at the corner there and they wait until you go into that little parking spot. Or it may be a parking spot, that, but they wait until you go across the street. See? And then they come and tow you. The moment you step across the street into the other parking lot, they tow you from here. Okay, so it's money. Okay, just like, just like the cops or the meter mates who just sit down there and wait for your meter, look at the meter and come 10. Nine. You know? And as soon as it's um,
So food must be at the proper temperature all the time, guys. Below 40 for regular uh, thawed out food, below 40, above 32. And above hot food, above, above 140. So the, the range, the danger zone is 40 degrees to 140 for two hours. Any food that's in that zone for two hours, you put, they recommend you throw it away. Restaurants put it on special. Yeah. <laughs> Especially if it's... I don't know. I've had food out overnight and then just reheat it up and it tasted fine That's to me. cooked. Yeah, no. Well, who the hell? You know, I can't cook it. Yeah, that's it. Never had a problem. Come on, man. But don't kill this way. You can get your fat. <laughs> so, guys, um, these guys, they have their own thermometer. They never ever depend on the one you have in your system. And they actually check internal temperatures too. They have those that you, the meat therm thermometer, the meat that they just push right through to the center of the meat approximately and they check it. If you have a bowl, like you have a bowl with salad, they're gonna stick their thermometer to about the center point and it should read below 40. Okay. Then they will check with their little um, we call that infrared thing. Yeah, yeah they, they 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 have those in their bags when they check with that. So they don't depend on your te temperatures, no thermometers. So don't. Now, prep units, I think you guys rented the pizza store, you see some of them with a the flip top. Those are, those are kind of the biggest culprit when it comes to having high product temperatures because <coughs> the top is open and it's all really good if the trays that they drop in are sitting and kissing each other. All right, if the lips are kissing each other, that way you have no air coming through or going down into the box. But the moment you left a space anyway in between that, hot air can go in, cool air can escape. And that area generally, they call it a rail, it's generally the biggest problem area. So what, um, what I expect you to do is every time you want something, you open the lid, take what you need and close it back. Nobody does that when a restaurant is busy. Because there are somebody's always taking their hand in there to get one of the hundred and one different condiments they have. I mean, even if you go to a Subway's or Taco Bell, you'll see everything open up there. The whole top is open up, All right. and it's a pain to keep that thing at the right temperature, and it's a pain to fix it because they have everything right under the the um, unit. And all you have is a space about this much in which you get in there and do it and fix it. Yeah. Especially um, subways, cheap ways. If, if you get a car from a subway for one of those units, mm -hmm. tell them to find somebody else. <laughs> I mean, if you have the choice. Yeah. Yeah, because the, the headache you get with it, it's really not worth the money sometimes. <clears throat> so normally what I do with these here is overnight, if they remember, they take out all these little containers with the condiments and put them in their walk-in boxes. So th that, uh, you know, just in case if that box goes down. And the smaller box is prone to failure than the bigger box they walk in. And if the small box fails to, it gets up to a high temperature pretty fast. But if the walk-in box fails, it maintains the temperature. If you do not open that door, typically it will keep the temperature it was at for about 24 hours before the, the product starts to spoil. All right? So even though the air product may go up, the, the product at the temperature, or the temperature of the product will stay in that safety zone for at least that 24 hours. Likewise for a freezer, 
your freezer can last about um, 36 hours before the meat or whatever it is in there start to tower. So it, you have that kind of room to play with in a walk-in, not so much in one of these regular regions. They're too small. They don't have their bulk, they don't have their um, mass to keep in any kind of heat in there. Or in this case, keeping any kind of cold. See, the thermostats that you will, the coil sensing thermostats they're talking about there, is a thermostat that goes and fit your. Remember the fins are running like this, right? Mm -hmm. And we normally take like a Phillips screwdriver and push it in between the fin and make a hole about the diameter of the tip of this marker. And then you push that sensor into the coil in between the fins. That's, that's the coil sensing temperature, so it actually senses the temperature of the refrigerant boiling in that coil and not the air temperature. Because if it senses air temperature, it's gonna, because it is an open top and it's a prep refrigerator, it will short cycle your compressor. Um, did any one of you guys, that Scotsman ice machine in there that's working right now, did you guys crank it up? No. 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 You can take can crank it up. Oh, you know what? No, I had, I fixed it up. Oh, yeah? Yeah. But I think the reason that everyone and I went into the other lab this morning, and apparently somebody sat on the sink and pulled it off of the wall and the drain that goes across from that Lab to the next lab. So they sat on the zinc? I think so. It's a white plastic sink over there, right? Yeah. In the other lab? Yeah. Yes. Oh. So the drain goes across, and I think the reason they didn't crank up that thing is because that drain is broken. The drain is broken. broken. Yes, so broken. If, we, if we start the ice machine, any water running out of the ice will be pumped onto the floor of the other lab. Right. And then they will get into those people across the other side, and they have. They have their offices there with their filing cabinets. And I remember the last time we had a flood in there. Those people lose a lot of stuff. They were pissed, but you know, came to a point. I'm not sure if they did it. They were supposed to lift, raise their floor about the end. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> so I think I know one time we couldn't stay in this building for a week because they 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 um kind of lay some kind of epoxy on the floor. So I'm not sure if that's the same time they raised the, the floor. But nobody could have stayed in this building for one week. <coughs> this is optional. Plant defrost for a medium temperature. What you will find, guys, and this is not unusual, you will find a lot of these boxes have a um, have a regular 24 hour timer, like you will see on a lawn sprinkler system, where it, it just has one on and one off trips, trip lever, mm -hmm. so that they set it typically at midnight, it turns off the system for about an hour or two. Let all the ice melt, and then about two o'clock in the morning, or maybe three, it goes back into refrigeration mode and bring up back the temperature. It's kind of like uh, it, your thing to do because you bring, you let it, for three hours, your temperature is above safety range. Yeah. And that's tell you only two hours is the recommended time you should keep it there. So you kind of do things uh, contrary to. Uh, they yeah. do it at night time, also nobody's there. Yeah, but the food is still going to spoil. Yeah, but nobody knows. <laughs> <laughs> at that time. <laughs> At that time, except when I go to the doctor next two days. <laughs> Why am 
by shitting so much. What was wrong with me? I guess that's what happens on those cruise ships, probably. Oh, God. <laughs> this, this is a typical prep, prep refrigerator, you see? You see the covers up here? Mm -hmm. yeah. And all the condiments? So whenever you finish a prep here, you're supposed to close that. Nobody does. All right? So you still have the... This you is that service no, this here is self-contained, the compressor and condenser unit is in the back, you see here? Okay. Yeah. Those vents there, they're just vent ports. So everything is in the back, and inside here is where the evaporator coil is. This is not, um, you will see this at Subway. Subway, um, this is a master built unit. Subway has a unit they call Duke. Duke Refrigeration has a contract to build all the Subway refrigerators. So, except the walk-in box. But all the little countertop refrigerators is uh, built by Duke Refrigeration for, for Subway. <laughs> now, remember, remember what I tell you how they measure? Yeah. This is my, Which is it? This is my probe here, right? And they're going to go right down into the, like into the middle of the product to check that temperature. I like those scoops. They look nice, right? Yeah. Okay. Temperature. Forty-six. That's too high, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, every amp, by the way, every subway has one of those. So I'm um, because they Nobody uses trying to Yeah, they use it. Oh yeah. So yes, that's I notice they're using for the one because that's FDA, okay? That's federal. That's federal, federal. but if local says and our local health code, Suffolk County, Nassau <coughs> County, it is forty degrees guys, so mm -hmm. You throw that out of the window when you're working on these people's stuff, right? Because you have to satisfy the local health, health inspectors here. Um, the only place I know there is FDAs across the building there. I mean, they always have two inspectors over there on site when they start production and end production. Yep. <laughs> Four to six hours, it depends on the rate of that um, your product too. Same as, you know, if you have a if you have a twenty pound rose or twenty twenty pound board, it will take longer than than a fifteen pounder. Because if it's um, required that you spend thirty minutes per pound, twenty pound would be six hours, right? Somewhere around there. And if it's 15, it's 450 minutes, which is less than six hours. Mr. Okay, sorry. Blast chillers designed to drop. Remember, I told you guys about blast chillers? Yes. Quickly, so that they can keep the thing. Lock in the freshness. So they'll come together, right? And yeast and what in the ice making section? Yeah. Well, the slimy residue. Usually, of course, in bars and bakeries. Yeah. Good. Never leave ice scoop in a bin. Fuck. <coughs> what are we doing the bomb with, bro? By the way, guys, Mr. Cockney will be doing a review of all the possible questions you can get on the final. Okay. Yes. So he's, he's, he's going to have my final plus a few more questions on the side that I may or may not decide to uh, incorporate. So he's going to go through all those questions. He's not giving you a copy, but he's going to go address every single question, give you the answer, how the question is formulated, and what have you. He's doing it this afternoon. This afternoon. Tomorrow morning we begin. Uh, okay. Last day the beginning of your new life. Uh -huh. You're right.
right? Yeah, the problem was that they have your like long right, right? You have yeah, your yeah. Up, you hold it. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna call them up front and tell them that you are here, okay? What's the um fix the thing? Okay. Tell me, can I 